behalf of the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution, I want to thank you for joining our virtual panel on prosecutors and crime survivors. This panel is following last year's release of our executive session paper on this exact topic, written by two of the four panelists we are fortunate to have joining us today, Lenore Anderson and Jackson County Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker. You can read this paper on our website, prosecution.org, and I have provided a link to this paper in the chat. This session is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch the full panel online if you cannot intend the, attend the entire panel today. We invite you to send questions throughout today's panel. You can click the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to send your questions directly to the host. Before we begin our panel, I'd like to read our land acknowledgement statement honoring both the land and culture of indigenous people across our country. We want to acknowledge that the IIP is based in New York City, which is Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude and acknowledge the genocide and continuous displacement of indigenous peoples. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built Manhattan during the colonial era and beyond. We acknowledge the harm inflicted upon the indigenous communities and people of color across the country, which inspires our ongoing work. Thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to our Deputy Director, Alyssa Mark Hideri. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you uh, to the IAP team for putting this together. Of course, to our panelists for dedicating their time to us and joining us. My name is Alyssa Mark Hideri. I'm the Deputy Director at the IAP. Uh, today, we're going to have a panel discussion about crime survivors. When people talk about criminal justice reform today, I think a lot of us um, seem to, you know, we think about the effects that the legal system has on people who are arrested, uh, prosecuted, and then ultimately incarcerated, and, and with good reason. Uh, but today's conversation is going to focus on something a little different. We're going to focus on a new crime survivors movement that is pushing for decarceration, um, but through the voices of those who have experienced crime firsthand as victims. So to get to dig into these issues, I'm so excited to bring together um, forward thinking visionaries. We have their full bios on our website, um, but just to introduce them, I'm gonna give a quick summary of who we have today. Um, so first up, we have County Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker, and she has served as County Prosecutor in Jackson County, Missouri, since May 2011. She's only the second woman elected to lead that office. Uh, County Prosecutor Baker's office has attracted national attention several times, including for her prosecution of a high-ranking cleric related to the Catholic Church's child sex abuse scandal. We also have Lenore Anderson. She's the president of the Alliance for Safety and Justice, an advocacy organization that works on criminal justice and public safety issues in seven different states and operates the largest network of crime survivors in the country uh, called Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice. Uh, Ms. Anderson was the co-author of Proposition 47, a Cal California ballot initiative in 2014 to reduce incarceration and reallocate prison spending to mental health and victim services. She was also part of the leadership team in the Prop 57 California campaign uh, tw in 2016 to expand earned credit for people in prison and also was on the leadership team for Florida's Amendment 4 campaign to restore voting eligibility to people with convictions. Our third panel uh, panelist is David Guizar from Los Angeles, California, and he's one of the founding members of Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, uh, also known as CSSJ. He has been leading trainings in advocacy and policy conducting outreach to survivors and helping to orchestrate the organization's survivor speak events across the country. And last but definitely not least, we have Dr. LaDonna Butler. She is the founder of the Well for Life, a wellness program in Florida. She currently works as a senior program manager for CSSJ, the same organization that Ms. Anderson and Mr. Huizar work for. Um, so welcome to all four of you. Thanks again for joining us. I think the, quest, the first question I'm going to ask is for Dr. Butler. I want to start with the basics. Some of our audience, a lot of whom are line prosecutors, may not be familiar with the term crime survivor. Uh, can you just please explain, Doctor, um, why someone might use that term instead of the word victim? 
Thank you so much. And thank you for all of you who are attending today. By allowing individuals to step into the power of their living through one of the worst experiences of their life, by allowing them and affirming that they are now attending to their well being, they're accessing and navigating the resources available in their community. It speaks to the incredible strength and power of an individual to face victimization and say, now I'm a survivor. See, being a crime survivor also allows individuals to advocate for their voices. It allows them to have strength in their story and for us to really recognize the tremendous um, contributions to our community that they have. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Ms. Anderson, maybe you can describe the crime, or excuse me, the survivors' um, rights movement that started decades ago that some of us might be more familiar with and how the movement that you're now leading is different. Thanks. I'm glad to be here this morning and, and have this uh, conversation. When people refer to the victims' rights movement, they're usually referring to the movement that started in the 1980s to advocate for laws that increased victims' rights in criminal proceedings. A lot of new laws were passed to achieve this, including constitutional amendments for victims' rights in most states. And those laws include things like victim notification in proceedings, uh, authorizing victim impact statements at sentencing, restitution, and more. These rights in criminal proceedings are valuable and for many have made a difference. That said, for the majority of victims of crime, there is no criminal proceeding. So what statistics tell us is that the majority of crime and violence is not reported to police and then of the crime and violence that's reported, less than half of that is prosecuted. So part of what our organization recognizes is that the focus on criminal proceedings is limited at best in providing a pathway for the justice system to be responsive to survivors of crime. The other challenge that emerged in the 80s is that uh, many of the calls for procedural rights for victims were attached to calls for ratcheting up mandatory sentencing, expanded three strikes policies across the country, expanded mandatory enhancements, and um, a lot of that tough on crime frame has been uh, kind of pr proposed as in the name of protecting uh, victims' rights. But what we saw at the community level uh, is really that the majority of crime survivors were not getting help to recover from crime and not relying on the justice system uh, for that recovery. Uh, most survivors of crime have not seen mass incarceration as a strategy to advance public safety. Um, so we as an organization with uh, David right there at the beginning started conducting outreach doing focus groups and a research with survivors of crime. And what we learned really kind of flips the notion on its head that tough on crime is what victims of crime want. Uh, what we found was the opposite, that most survivors recognize uh, that to stop the cycle of crime, we've, we've got to invest in prevention and rehabilitation, um, and that that's actually much more important. Uh, in fact, there's a preference among diverse uh, survivors of crime across the country for shortening sentences in order to allow for increased investments in prevention and recovery. And so that's really at the heart of what we've been uh, focused on for the last eight years. Thank you, um, David. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, the outreach that you did that Lenore just, just referenced um, in talking to survivors and sort of what they, in your experience, often want to see out of the criminal justice system that maybe they weren't getting um, in the traditional realm. Yes, uh, good morning and, and thank you for the, for the um, land acknowledgement. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very important for us to also look at this from a historical perspective, right? And um, I'm not gonna dig into that, but just the acknowledgement, I think is very, very significant. Um, and, and then, you know, to, to Ms. Uh, Lenore's point and Dr. Butler's point too, is I think that what I would like to raise is, the stigma with victimization, right? So um, we were at a time where uh, in 2012, where, um, and still to today, the, 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 the big conversation around boys and men of color. Uh, so when we looked at boys and men of color and, and, and where we would be working 
um, you know, in communities to, to raise the elements of unreported crime. Uh, we looked at those hard zip codes um, that, that often um, had high numbers of incarceration. And, and in order for us to, to, we had to use the logic that there had to be some type of connection to victimization and the harm um, that people were uh, uh, doing onto others. So we had to get rid of the stigma of victimization. And that's why uh, the survivor element is huge, right? Because we triumphed, we made it through a, a very difficult time. And um, so it's very, very important that, that we uh, promote uh, uh, reporting in a way where it addresses um, the element of resources, right? That, that in order to heal, in order to, to advance and, 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 and be in a better place, there needs to be some type of support versus the suppressive uh, 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 approach of law enforcement that would often, re, you know, respond to the to the to like a homicide or or a shooting or 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 something like that where it doesn't require someone necessarily calling; they're just responding to to the incident, right? Uh, versus the 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 lesser uh, harms um, that are still uh, very impactful, but that are not, you know, you don't hear them, you don't see them all the time. Um, and, and we wanted to just bring everything out front. So the first element was to, to touch on the stigma around survivor, um, around victimization and, and, and how to uh, elevate it through a survivor element to, to begin the process of, of bringing in these communities that were often not at the table, but were the targets of these tough on, on crime laws. Thank you. Um, County Prosecutor Baker, can you, you know, in the paper that you co-wrote with uh, Ms. Anderson, and, and for those of you who are watching, that paper is available on our website. Um, Ms. Baker, can you just explain some of the challenges your office has had in helping crime survivors beyond the courtroom? And that's a challenge that you talked about in the paper that you co-wrote and what your office has done to address those problems. Thank you and good morning. It's good to see you and um, my friend Lenore, it's good to see you this morning as well. So um, I, I think the, the biggest challenge a prosecutor has is the majority of victims. And when I say majority, it's a large uh, majority of victims never see the inside of a courtroom because their case is never solved. And so they never even have a shot at, at justice, whatever that justice may look like, as flawed as our system uh, might be uh, for victims and for uh, criminal defendants and all the historical um, wrongs that have happened uh, through my system. The truth is um, the vast majority never ever see that kind of justice for them. It never works for them. And what they do experience, though, is that it does seem to work for them, you know, on the incarceration side, right? So um, they feel, um, not just feel, but it, it, it's, um, it happens in those certain zip codes uh, that David talked about, where there's a high rate of incarceration. Um, but what also correlates with that is a really low rate of justice uh, for those same individuals who are victims of crime. And when I say victimization, you know, I mean, we could be talking about stolen autos, but really what I focus on is shooting victims. You know, those non-fatal shooting victims who um, in my jurisdiction, in my largest police jurisdiction, uh, less than 20%, less than 20% of non-fatal shooting victims even uh, get referred to my office for prosecution. So that means they get nothing. They get no service at all. And if you don't have strong, um, community um, nonprofit organizations that can really reach out to them and help them, they are just left to fend for themselves. And to me, uh, that is a, that's the making of an unhealthy community. Um, and so folks like me have to do a much better job of showing what good health looks like. That means we do not allow uh, those folks who have been hurt and injured uh, to suffer alone without helping them and giving them a helping hand and, and trying to not just mend their wounds, but uh, heal their trauma. And then, um, you know, potentially even, um, you know, through a program I started, you know, like uh, doing minor home repairs where bullets uh, rid riddled their home or cars. Um, you know, maybe this is an awful thing, but in my jurisdiction, cleaning up of uh, uh, blood, 
left behind at, at crime scenes. Um, it's a, um, an awful thing, but it is a reality where I live because I live in a very violent jurisdiction. And um, certain neighborhoods uh, are really struggling. Um, they carry the weight and the burden for everybody else um, with that, that high rate of, um, of violence. So that doesn't mean when I speak in that voice that I believe in a tough on crime kind of stance. I believe you know, really in trying to be smarter about how we've done this in the past and with an eye toward do no harm, uh, do no harm. Let's try and uh, lift people up and, and mend them wholly, uh, mend whole blocks where, you know, where crimes have happened, but also uh, mend communities uh, that have been so harmed um, by systems. And, and County Prosecutor Baker, how is it that your office is able to identify um, these survivors if, I, I can't remember if you said it was unreported or or unsolved, but how is your office sort of getting involved in situations where you're not actually prosecuting the incident or prosecuting the case? So it, it, it's, um, I've been a prosecutor a long time and I will confess uh, one of my failings has been how long it's taken me to figure this part out. Um, how long it took me to figure out um, you know, solve rates um, are so poor in jurisdictions with a high rate of violence. And when that is the case, um, it's incumbent upon um, folks like me to, to grab a hold of that data, you know, to really, really focus on data so you can figure out, um, you don't wait for a crime to come to you as a prosecutor. I mean, that's, that's been, the, that's the traditional role of a prosecutor and that no longer can work. Uh, that's just not good enough. And so uh, several years ago, we started um, getting all uh, reported um, non-fatal shootings and literally knocking on the door of the non-fatal shooting victim, whether they were cooperative or not, and said, how can we help you? We wanna, um, we, we'd start with, by delivering a fresh bag of groceries and say, you know, we are here to help you. Of course, it wasn't me going, it was a multidisciplinary team that went um, really focusing on victim services. And sometimes those victims are, are handled really harshly um, by law enforcement because they, um, aren't cooperative. They don't, you know, they, it turns out they didn't see anything. They, they can't give a car description. They can't give a, um, much information to police. And maybe, um, you know, often it's suspected they simply don't want to, or they want to go handle it themselves. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, but we cannot meet that kind of, of um, person, a sur crime survivor with hostility. <laughs> you know, we have to, we have to figure out why um, why, why don't they want our help? Why don't they trust us to help them? And then, um, then we have to lead with ways uh, to build that trust and uh, to build faith uh, with them, you know, show them good faith that we are there uh, truly to help them. And so, um, you know, that old saying that hurt people hurt people is so true. Um, people who are, have experienced high rates of, of trauma are probably, um, you know, going to live in a community where, you know, it, it, um, that high rate of trauma might show up in other ways. So it's incumbent upon us to, to figure it out. And um, the way I view it, it's just being a good community steward. Um, when one is down, we're all down. And so, you know, we got to figure out how to, how to lift people up. And that means you can't, as a prosecutor, I can't wait for the, that mere 20% of non-fatal shootings to come here and then give it my all on those cases. That's, um, that's just so far beyond um, what is helpful to a community. It's getting out of a building like this and getting on the street and, and really offering real services and in a very consistent manner. Thank you. I was wondering if any of the other panelists want to respond to um, County Prosecutor Baker's office's approach in terms of knocking on doors of um, survivors who you know, may not be as cooperative um, uh, or, or are not sure that they can trust law enforcement in these really tough situations. I want to acknowledge that, sh that she's out there doing something. I want to acknowledge that when we see people's humanity and attempt to attend to their concrete needs, we want to affirm that. We also want to be um, cautious in our language around cooperability. As you just said, we understand that there have been communities that have experienced more harm when actively seeking support for themselves and their families than actually getting the help they need. 
So number one, it's not being uncooperative. It is being protective in the only way that they understand in order to ensure the safety of themselves and their family. So we wanna work on our language around how we engage individuals who have been impacted by crime. The second thing I'll say, um, I also affirm and acknowledge that bringing groceries and ensuring that we're asking individuals how they are doing after, um, after being hurt is so important. So whether that's the first contact with an advocate, um, an opportunity to hear, uh, share their story during the interview and investigation process, or the decision to not prosecute a case. That same spirit of hearing an individual story is critical if we are going to create the types of communities that can all work together in order to mitigate the harm that is being done. Um, so I just wanted to add those two things in, one about our language, and then second, around why individuals may find other means of being protective of themselves and others during the investigation and prosecution um, process. And doctor, maybe you can just clarify for our, our listeners or our viewers why a crime survivor might feel like they're actually being protective of themselves and their families, um, you know, when in the eyes of law enforcement, they're being, you know, quote unquote, uncooperative. Mm -hmm. So number one, incarceration does not resolve criminal um, harm. It doesn't. We cannot incarcerate ourselves out of this issue. And for too long, incarceration and long-term sentences has been the only avenue in which individuals are able to, number one, access help or to elevate the concern around safety in their community. Secondly, you just named it. Even if an individual reached out and asked for help, the likelihood, especially if the individual lives in a community that is perceived as harmful or, risk, or at risk, and if the individuals uh, meet the description of someone who would seem to be at more risk, we understand that they are more likely to have an adverse encounter with the person in which they were supposed to be getting help from. So that would be the second reason. And then historically, as we look on the beauty as well as the opportunities, we have not had a, a long-standing, consistent relationships with our systems that would allow individuals to navigate equitably and navigate in a way that ensures their overall safety. See, we've had these practices for too long and unfortunately the outcomes are, are what the outcomes are. So I'm gonna point back to the report and I'm also gonna report back to sitting down and listening to individuals who have survived crimes and ask them, well, what does safety really look like? And what does it take for us to get there? And what I know you will find is an individual who really believes um, in prevention, an individual who believes in ensuring that they have access to resources, and an individual who believes in restoration. I, I know that to be true. The longer we've been doing this work, the more I have found that to be true. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Guzar, I feel like you were about to say something, but I wanted to give you a chance before I ask another question. Hello, I mean, uh, uh, County Prosecutor Baker, thank you for, for stepping out, you know, and, 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 and doing things uh, differently. I know that, that um, you know, the, the acknowledgement of, of the non-fatal shootings is, is where the numbers drop, right, and un, unreported harm. And, and there's a diversity and a widespread element of what they are. So um, the, 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 you know, intergenerational violence is what we're uh, faced with. So there's like all these different layers and, 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 and people uh, choosing to, to counter violence with more violence. And, and I think that one of the pieces that, that we have worked on is, is definitely 
working on, on uh, intergenerational healing, right? So that if we are able to respond in a manner in which you describe with some of those elements in place and, and acknowledging where people are and, and meeting them um, where they are, because every situation is different, um, then we begin that process of, of, of not just enabling trust, but um, um, you know, giving uh, people an opportunity to, to respond in a way uh, that is that is good for them, right? That 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 in the midst of trauma, it's pretty hard hard to to uh, remember what happened. You know, uh, we find that that people are are not ready to cooperate or report uh, within seventy two hours, right? We've looked at those uh, lengths of time that people have to report, and and it's sometimes it doesn't even connect to the ability for someone to comprehend the harm that they've uh, experienced and, and, and be in, in, a, in, in a process of cooperating in order to receive um, uh, somewhat of a, of a bit of, of resource, right? Uh, uh, I think that the most substantial one is mental health. And, and you know, it's about 30 hours, you know, 30 hours of, 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 of work that someone is able to uh, be supported with. Uh, so we need to look at the sustainable elements of, of the response, right? That it's not a one-time or two-time element, but what's the sustainable element? And, and, um, and, and thank you for acknowledging that so much of the healing element of our communities, it's connected to the district attorney's office, right? Well, oftentimes we would probably ask ourselves, well, why? Why are we raising the concern of the district attorney is because so much wellness is connected to you uh, as an office. And that's on a country wide, um, you know, process that law enforcement goes through uh, uh, the uh, prosecutor. They, they, there's a decision to be made whether we support a family or not. So um, the shift that you're creating is, is, is definitely one that's good and connects to a lot of the work that we've already uh, um, started as well. And, um, and, and that so many uh, prosecutors like yourself and, and law enforcement are, 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 are asking, like, where have you been? Like, why haven't you been here before? And because there, was re there wasn't really a table for us to be at, but the table is in place and we continue to open up the door for more to come. So thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Anderson, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, some of the, the projects or ballot initiatives or anything else um, that your organization is working on. I know it's a, a huge organization spanning across several states, but anything you can tell us um, since this movement has been developing for, for some time under your leadership. Sure, well, one of the um, solutions that we identified early on really touches on what um, we are talking about this morning, which is this issue of unaddressed trauma. You know, what uh, LaDonna was describing was really a, a justice system that's um, beyond sort of out of touch and sort of disconnected, especially to communities of color. It's also just not trauma informed, right? I used to work uh, in a prosecutor's office, it's, you know, it, the trauma literacy in the criminal justice system is very low. And so um, that's one key thing that we've been working on is expanding support for recovering from trauma. Uh, and so it, we identified one solution, which is what's called a trauma recovery center. And this is a sort of one stop comprehensive uh, uh, place where victims of crime can receive long term help and can receive that help in all of the different ways it's needed, whether that's help filling out a victim compensation form, whether that's help relocating, help accessing uh, long-term mental health support. All of those things can happen in one roof, whether or not there's a prosecution, whether or not there's an investigation, whether or not there's a case at all. So this model um, is really critical because it starts with uh, individual survivors needs. And we've been able to advocate that this, uh, this innovative model it previously existed only in one jurisdiction in California. And now uh, through advocacy at the legislative level uh, and budget advocacy in all the different states we work in, I think we're up to 
um, I think we're up to 35 across the country now that we have uh, advocated for that governments have responded and then uh, helped uh, put funding on the table to build. Um, and those uh, trauma recovery centers uh, really have uh, it, it, the seeds of what it looks like to have a trauma-informed response uh, across, across communities. So we're really excited and proud of that. Um, I just also comment on, you know, one of the things that David was describing in terms of the extreme limitations that are placed on support, um, government funded support for victims, whether that's a limitation on the number of mental health sessions you can um, actually get paid for uh, through victim compensation, or a limitation on the time uh, that you can even apply for victim compensation it has to be within a year, it has to be right, or if you have a prior record, you, you're, you're not eligible in certain states. All of those extreme limitations um, uh, worsen the experience for victims of crime in, in, in engaging with the justice system and also limit our ability to really help people stabilize. Um, you know, the number one um, indicator that someone will be a victim of crime in the future is if they have been a victim of crime in the past. So this notion that we would surround ourselves uh, with support and help when someone experiences violence and harm is not only good for the health of that individual, it's good as a safety and a violence reduction strategy overall. So those are those are some things we're working on. And maybe um, either for Ms. Anderson or any of the other panelists, how is it that things like the trauma recovery centers um, or these services, especially for um, survivors of uncharged crimes, how that can help in the movement to, to decrease incarceration. Um, I think I understand, but um, I'll take us, um, you know, just back to the notion of, of, um, of um, untreated trauma, right? So, so for example, my, in, in 20, in 2000, in, in I mean, hold on, hold on. In 1983, my brother Oscar was murdered, and I was 10 years old, and um, we didn't get any type of response, you know, uh, to to support our family. Um, the internal makings of our family just totally broke down. Um, you know, we all kind of like, um, you know, siloed uh, and did, you know, what, what we thought was best. And, and for me, it was really drinking and using, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol and and participating in, in running around in the streets, a little bit of gang activity here, a little bit of that. And, and, and really, uh, until it's really took its toll on, on, on my spiritual being, on my physical being. And, and, and really, the, I think that the not having a peace of mind. So I started to seek other ways to, 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 um, to bring some type of healing into myself. And it's a process. And, and when I started my recovery, you know, I've been sober now for for 14 years, and and um, and, and and unfortunately, in, in 2012, when I was six years uh, uh, sober, you know, my, my brother, my brother Gilbert was murdered and um, at a wedding, and um, and I had to relive that trauma all over again, right? So I think that when I was 10 years old, and up to the point where where I had not, you know access that 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 ability to not have to medicate myself with drugs and alcohol um that there was a big part of me that would consistently think about well if i knew who did that to my brother i would definitely go after that person right so i think it's what 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 uh county prosecutor uh, uh baker described right like like we we take it into our own hands with with this element of when it happened to my brother gilbert it didn't make me feel any better it doesn't mean that i didn't think about it but i wanted to be a part of the solution you know one of the things that my mom wanted was uh and that she didn't uh get um you know with my brother oscar was that there wasn't there wasn't a prosecution right so with my brother gilbert it was very important for me to work with law enforcement uh by just you know calling you know, uh, uh, making sure that the family, and, and I was trying to figure all this out, right? I, I didn't know. There was an, a, 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 um, a system navigator working with me or anything like that. Um, I was, you know, knocking at the door. Uh, I learned about a few things, you know, including Marcy's Law. I went to the prosecutor. 
you know, and asked about it and, and they didn't know what I was talking about. I almost got, you know, uh, removed from the office because I was upset that the person that was in that seat at the time wouldn't, you know, or, or didn't know what I was talking about and all they had to do was point me to a different direction. But I think that, that the healing is super important. You know, I think that, um, you know, having the ability to walk into a space where, where we could access healing is, is super important. You know, it's super important. I, I participate in a, you know, on a, this evening, I'll be on a, you know, meeting, um, you know, criminal and gang anonymous meeting uh, that a good friend of mine facilitates with, 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 with a good number of individuals, some of them that have come home after serving um, 20, 30 years, some for inflicting like the outmost harm. And, and, we, and we just talk about life, you know, and, and a lot of them are like in reentry homes, but my friend making herself available and sharing her recovery uh, with these gentlemen and, uh, and myself included uh, gives us the ability to speak about healing versus, you know, continuing on the path of that culture of criminal activity, right? So now imagine if we were able to expand those type of conversations throughout our communities uh, through resources or just people like ourselves that have lived that experience that we have avenues to to construct these conversations, um, I think that is important. You know, the Trauma Recovery Centers gives us like a system, uh, a, a structure around it uh, that is directly connected uh, to the systems. But, but I think that it's important that we continue to expand these models. You know, 14 trauma recoveries yeah. in the state of California from one. So um, healing is super, super important. Thank you so much um, for sharing that very difficult and personal story. Uh, one thing I want to ask all the panelists, and I'll ask, um, I'll start with County Prosecutor Baker, is it's hard to have a conversation these days without bringing up COVID-19. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, what impact um, the virus has had on your office's ability to interact with crime survivors and how your office is sort of meeting that challenge. Um, given that, I mean, perhaps I'm, you might not be able to do things such as knocking on everybody's door and, and dropping off groceries, or, or maybe you are finding ways to do that, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how your office is, is handling this difficult, um, difficult time. Well, the first thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, COVID sucks, but it's been good in some ways for us. It's been really tragically bad for us in some ways. I'll start with the good, though. The good is it's... Um, you know, for, for bureaucratic systems, um, it's really um, an opportunity for us when that gets, when our bureaucratic system gets interrupted in some way for us to go, oh, okay, what, how can we do this different? And uh, what were we doing before? And then asking, huh, why did we do that? Um, so we've had a lot of those moments where we've been able to look at, at crimes that, um, that occur in my jurisdiction at a lower level and try and figure out is there another way to do these? Do we have to go through uh, the, the bureaucratic process always to solve this or to address um, the kind of harm that that particular case may represent? And I think the answer is no, we don't. We don't have to use this process, this, um, this harmful process. So I'm um, trying some different kinds of efforts that are a pre-filing diversion effort um, so that um, we take some cases out of the criminal justice system that are just sort of um, languishing anyway, uh, trying to get people real help and without the harm, without the harm, even though you know we dismiss cases later, the filing of a case is harmful. The filing of a case is harmful. Now, often it triggers, the filing of a case triggers other pieces of play that help us do our work, but we've had to just be creative and thinking our way out of that kind of system. And, um, you know, we've also looked at the cases we were filing, you know, and I've been very aggressive pre-COVID uh, pre to look at cases uh, that didn't need to be at the state level uh, that maybe didn't need to be. Um, we're looking at cases through, a, um, you know, what is sent to us from that racial equity lens. How did this case get here? Um, why? Um, you know, what, what caused law enforcement to be in that place at that time? 
um, in that neighborhood on that street. And we're really looking at it from that racial equity lens to see how we can score uh, that back out of the system. So um, with that notion of do no harm, but also I want to do more than do no harm. I want to actually help. You know, the, the, the reason you go into this kind of work is you want to you want to help people. And so um, it is about delivering services in other settings. And I, I realize I represent a system that is not trusted um, in the communities that I, I really need it to trust me. You know, I need, um, and, but we are not there. Uh, that's and because there has just been so much harm um, historically, but also presently. I mean, there's harm that happens now. So I don't want to, you know, pretend like all of this is historical in nature. It's not. It's happening um, as we speak. So how do we, you know, how do we uh, reform a relationship with community is what um, my, my mantra has been, I guess, for uh, a number of years, recognizing, you know, that I represent a system that, um, with good reason is not trusted. So the, the harm though of COVID um, has been, you know, those people that are charged with murders um, are just sitting um, in the county jail because the system has really, it's not stopped, but it has slowed greatly. You know, getting a jury trial has been really difficult. So we're, we're uh, slowly trying to uh, get started back up, um, but it's difficult um, because it, it this, you know, if I represent a bureaucratic system, imagine what the court system <laughs> looks like, right? I mean, it's, uh, uh, we're not like the most creative thinkers as well, you know, to work through problems. So, so we are trying, um, but that's, that's been a harm. And um, we've been able to reduce our jail population uh, fairly significantly, but it has inched back up as this has gone on um, longer. And, um, with, and so the answer has to be, the system has to work. We have to keep uh, flowing cases through so the people are just not sitting there languishing. And that, that's true on both sides of that equation, right? For a victim's family, you know, the a survivor's family is, is waiting for answers and they don't get any and they're frustrated and they're getting angry. And um, a defendant's family is wondering, hey, when is my son or daughter gonna get a chance uh, to see the inside of a courtroom, you know, to have their side of this heard? And um, we've, we just have to figure that out. And we've been slow, I think, um, at figuring that out amid COVID um, because jury trials are, are a real challenge here. And so this is not a critique really on my court. It's a, this is a real uh, sticky problem and they've really been working hard to try and figure it out, but that's, um, COVID sucks. <laughs> so <laughs> I would stay with COVID sucks. That's a good thing. I, I was going to say that it's important to recognize that our justice system already, like you acknowledge, is not very trauma informed. So in addition to the trauma of COVID, um, which only delays process, delays individuals from being heard, delays individuals from having a sense of closure from this aspect of their life, um, COVID is amplifying um, inequities in our system and delaying individuals to be um, individuals accessing the resources that they need. This also points back to the initial question you asked around um, healing services or uh, wellness services being tied to criminal justice. If individuals don't want to report a crime or report something that happened to them, that should not stop them from accessing resources. See, we need investment in community resources so that no matter what happens in their community, they are able to access them. Right now with COVID, we understand that individuals need to access virtually. They need to be able to access services by having the resources to have some protection between them and the individuals that they need to, um, to hear their story and help them navigate their um, process. And so COVID is impacting that, but we are being innovative in the way um, we can respond. See, the typical experiences of survivors of crime, um, they often feel isolated, unheard, rushed, not sure on what's happening. And that's only being amplified by COVID. And when alternatives aren't present, um, it makes a complicated situation even more complicated. And really, this is where I believe um, prosecutors are important. See, you have the opportunity to actually listen to the needs of survivors. 
And so the reality is we have a system that is broken. Um, however, we can play our part in ensuring that we're listening and putting alternatives in so people can feel as heard as they can and that there are a multiple um, multitude of solutions that they can select from in order to go on their healing journey. See, the survivors that I have an opportunity to work with actually sought out opportunities to sit with people who have caused harm in their own life and have been denied access to restorative justice. See, that has to stop. If individuals who have been harmed want to have a sit down and want a restoration um, or restorative nature of, of uh, healing, then we need to have that as a solution. Um, there are many reasons why prosecution doesn't happen, um, but we don't wanna be that delay. And we understand that COVID has played a significant um, part in the delay of justice and a delay in the part of access to resources. But we can do something about that now by amplifying just the need to have um, budgets that align with community safety and resources that, uh, mental health resources specifically, that allow individuals to get the help they need until they, they are ready to um, be in the accountability system that we are all striving to have. Thank you so much. I just want to um, remind our viewers, if they have any questions, they can type some questions in the q and I see one question, which I'll ask in a second. Um, but first, I wanted to ask Ms. Anderson, you know, uh, Dr. Butler mentioned budgets and that we need budgets that can that help survivors. Are there things you think that prosecutors' offices can do in case they're not able, um, they just don't have as many resources as usual given COVID-19's impact? Um, and given the fact that many prosecutors' offices are facing budget cuts, things um, that prosecutors can do to help survivors during these times when um, they're not able to do as much face-to-face -face outreach. The time that, oh, go ahead. Just gonna throw out a couple of, couple of ideas. One is I just wanna uh, say I agree with what uh, Prosecutor Baker was saying about taking a step back and asking the question, what are the drivers of the uh, prosecutor's office budget right now? And are those drivers like worth it in the time of crisis, right? It, are there lower level crimes that we can divert? Are there drug crimes or other types of crimes that can be deprioritized so that we can reallocate the office dollars to the more acute public safety challenges uh, that jurisdiction is facing. So a bird's eye view on the uh, overall drivers of the budget is gonna be critical. And then the other um, thing I would offer is that I, I think in every uh, uh, city and county and, and jurisdiction, prosecutors have uh, the bully pulpit, right? Prosecutors are an incredibly powerful voice in public policy. And when you know we uh, first started reaching out to um, organizations that serve victims after COVID erupted, uh, we learned really difficult challenges that were happening. Um, you know, domestic violence shelters who suddenly had to take uh, and re redistribute how uh, rooms in their homes were set up, right? So they can separate out and and not have people staying in the same rooms seeing the number of people on their waiting lists quadruple, you know, go much higher than that. Trauma recovery center workers who meet survivors of crime at the hospital being denied access to the hospital because of uh, health concerns, uh, re-entry providers not having PPE in order to be able to uh, make sure people are returning home. So when we did all this outreach to those frontline community service providers, we really saw this um, need for public officials, including prosecutors, to call for increased, more flexible dollars and increased state and federal dollars into community-based services. By using the bully pulpit of a prosecutor office, we can start to advocate for more general dollars going to those frontline service providers, and that can be a way that prosecutors can make a difference. Thank you. Um, also wanted to tell our viewers that uh, a couple of times our panelists have used the phrase trauma-informed prosecution. Uh, IAP has done um, 
several trainings and events related to this topic. So please go to our website if you want more information on what that term means, on the training materials that our organization has put out there. Um, County Prosecutor Baker, we have a couple questions, actually a lot of <laughs> questions in the, feature, in the chat feature here that is directed specifically to you. Um, the first one is, uh, is your victim witness division meeting in person or virtually with survivors um, during COVID-19? And second, what roles make up the multidisciplinary team for the victim services? So when those teams show up, you know, is it a social worker or is it a prosecutor? Or if you can go into a little bit of detail about that. I think you're muted. There's a lot of people who probably wish that uh, they had access to my mute button now. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for the questions. I think um, we do meet with victims in different settings. So we're doing a lot, um, you know, through uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and however else we can we can have those kinds of meetings in a safe way. But we're also doing in person because there's a, just a I, I do some in person as well. I've met with people in their yards, <laughs> not necessarily so private, um, but it is it is um, an important respect, I think, to continue to try and show. So, um, so we're doing them a variety of different ways. And, um, you know, we're doing our best when they are in person, you know, to have, um, the, you know, the, a different kind of room where we can spread out and everybody wears masks. So, um, so we've continued to have those. As far as the multidisciplinary team, I send um, only those prosecutors that I trust are, are trauma informed that have had the right training and that I trust uh, to be with a team to knock on the door. They are also not the lead. Um, it is a victim advocate uh, from my office that's a lead along with that's been here uh, for a really uh, long time and, and truly gets it. Uh, but we also pair ourselves with a community um, organization um, that, um, you know, it includes a, a pastor and um, other victim advocates. Um, they offer counseling service as well. So that, that's part of our team. So there's not uh, really a law enforcement arm to it and there's not a law enforcement lead to it. And it was really important for me to offer the notion of this is, you know, any kind of help we're giving you is not conditional on whether or not you provide uh, information um, about your case. It is um, in no way do those two things um, meet each other because there are there are certain programs and, and certain state monies that go to victims that require such things. So I wanted to make sure they knew uh, this is not the requirement for us. Uh, we're here um, just because we should be here because you were harmed and we want to help you. And so the, the um, piece that's been most important to me is that we offer counseling services often Pre-COVID, we were doing in-home counseling services, um, and now there is some telehealth um, process uh, that we are using to be able to continue that function. It's probably, um, uh, you know, um, anything we can do uh, to meet victims is, is important during this period of time, but I do really miss the, that one-on-one -on -one interaction as often as uh, we were having it before. Um, so that, that's, uh, been, that's limited us a little bit. But that's how we do it. Um, we, we really allow the, the community service agency to be our lead. Um, and because I think that they just have a more trusted uh, role in community than we do. So we recognize um, that we represent a system. Thank you. Um, another question in the chat that I'm seeing, uh, I'll direct this one to uh, the other three panelists, anybody who wants to take a crack at it. Uh, um, how do crime survivors experience having their voices heard through victim impact statements? So um, either, you know, maybe if you've uh, helped a survivor um, prepare a statement or if you've spoken to somebody who has, um, you know, had their statement made in court for them, if you've had any interactions and how um, that helped them in the process or, or maybe did not help them as much in the process. I believe that any time that we can hear survivors, that is a part of our healing journey. So whether through the victim um, statement, which is one form of hearing them, um, it allows them to express what happened to them 
and for them to really elevate what they want to want to happen in the future. So I believe some survivors have found it to be a useful tool. Other survivors have actually struggled with the writing of the statement. And so the more we can allow diverse ways for individuals to have their voices heard in our system, um, the better we are at, at our responsiveness. See, what we do know is there are some survivors um, in our network that come from all walks of life and have all differing um, ways that they would like to see justice carried out. What we want to make sure is that as they're staying, making their statements and asking for accountability and sharing what has happened to them, that we have a system that can be more responsive. Um, what we want to make sure is as victims and as survivors are sharing their statements, that we are able to meet them with the resources that they need, like mental health, um, addiction treatment, rehabilitation, all of those things are necessary. So as survivors are speaking, we are then responsive and meeting them with programs, services um, that say we heard you. Thank you. Um, sorry, was somebody going to say something or? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to elaborate yeah. on that because it, it takes me back to, um, you know, to when I made a victim's uh, statement uh, in my brother's case, uh, Gilbert, and and just thinking about what Miss, um, uh, I mean, Dr. Butler was just mentioning of of, of it's a great opportunity um, for the system to to listen. And, and respond because basically what we're declaring is what our needs are, right? Like what has been removed in the loss um, uh, of, uh, in this case for me, my loved one, right? Uh, I mean, my niece was there, my, my, my brother Gilbert's uh, daughter, his, his ex-wife, you know, my, 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 my nephew, Luis, and, and, um, and, and um, so, and myself, right? And, and my mom couldn't be there because she would have, just lashed out and and so there's different uh perspectives in which we're addressing and i think that um the way that dr butler described it is we we are um if that was to manifest it it's like it gives us options right it gives yeah. us a, a variety of ways in which we could um you know support you know including um you know what often calls uh restorative justice right because you know we have a an opportunity to also speak to 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 the person who who's on the other side of, of that harm, right? And it's probably the only time that we will be able to have that kind of connection, right? And I chose not to carry that hatred um, and and say, you know what, I forgive you, right? Um, how he feels that that later when he left that space or five years down the line, I I, I don't know, right? Like. Uh, what's the process of healing in his life, right? Even in, in, in being able to participate as a good citizen inside the institution. Uh, I just met a young lady who for five years did good service in, uh, in a youth program inside of a prison. She was just served 20 years. Um, and, 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 and the spinoff of what she did inside is what she's doing in the community now, right? So I love that answer. And I just wanted to give you a little perspective of what it felt like for me and my family. And I'll quickly um, add, because we are coming to a close, that in that system, and to speak to David's point, the work in Florida, we've, by, because survivors spoke, we were able to actually change some legislation. We were able to ensure that individuals who had previously been harmed and, um, and had been resulted in causing harm, we understood that it made no sense to not allow them to be able to be restored back to community. So the work in Florida included occupational licensing reform so that people with convictions um, could apply for jobs, um, that individuals who had a previous encounter with um, law enforcement and previous experience of causing harm were able to access victims' compensation if they became a victim again for themselves. Um, we've also been able to work with deep domestic violence centers to help them get more support from the state when COVID hit. See, why that, how that ties to the victim impact statement is because ultimately 
when individuals are provided a space to have their voices heard, it is directly connected to what their healing journey will be long term. So not just in the courtroom, which it needs to be accessible for, we need to take time, support individuals in providing those statements in multiple formats. But then how do we continue to hear survivors and respond to them by having policies and budgets that are aligned to ensure that our communities are safer and that they are able to be restored in community through the process that fits best for them. Thank you so much. I think that is a very positive and uplifting note to end this panel on. Um, I want to thank our panelists again. Thank you so much. Um, especially for those of you in California. I know you had to be up and ready to go at eight o'clock in the morning today. So thanks again for joining us. And thank you for uh, our audience members for, for participating and, and for the questions in the chat feature. Thanks again. Thank you all so much.